Hello, this is Nitin Dahad with EE Times. I'm here at the Semi Industry Strategy Symposium uh, 2024 in Vienna, in Austria, and um, I have the pleasure of, of chatting to Ajit Manocha, who's the president and CEO of Semi, who's uh, come over from the US. Uh, Ajit, hello. Hello, how are you, Nitin? Fine. So, um, tell me, uh, Ajit, uh, you, you, you did the opening presentation here and uh, some interesting um, uh, facts. I mean, you talked about the, uh, the, the three waves, you know, the IoT, AI, and quantum, in, you know, that are sort of driving uh, demand for the semiconductor industry. But just tell us a little bit about um, how the AI and quantum uh, sector is driving this. And also, I think you made a statement that you know, maybe uh, qu quantum might get us to the five trillion mark as opposed to one trillion by 2030, five trillion by tw 2050. Well, I think uh, what I'm saying is uh, already been talked about around the world, especially about AI. I mean, you've heard uh, how NVIDIA stock has gone through the roof and uh, other companies who are working with AI are rising with the tide. And uh, you also heard the statements from Sam Altman and company about the, the future. So I don't think there's a debate anymore whether AI, what AI will do for us. Mm. I think we all know that AI will do a major transformation of the way we do uh, our business, the way we live, the way we work. Is 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 the the wave has started, and uh, of course uh, the the everything when we start it comes with some challenges, and for example with AI. One of the biggest challenges that the it also they are also energy guzzlers. So unless we solve the the heat dissipation uh, energy conservation uh, challenges for building new chips, uh, this will that will slow us down. And of course, it will slow slow down all the excitement that we see with the AI coming. And uh, I think right now the big challenge for all of us is to going on the AI uh, uh, wave but it will not work unless we also enhance the development of new materials, which will make the chips cooler and faster uh, and uh, bring us the benefits that AI will bring us. But quantum is yet uh, uh, another wave, but we have bigger challenges on quantum same, similarly. I mean, right now the quantum computer works uh, with the, at a zero degree Kelvin temperature, and that's not practical for, 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 for people. That would be like big mainframe computers we used to have uh, in 70s and 80s in a big uh, big rooms and uh, but today's supercomputers are in your pocket and that transformation will take years but that transformation will be limited with the new materials which will be make us to to make quantum computer work at a room temperature. Mm. Now the things have changed a lot. Uh, I know that when I started in this industry in Bell Laboratories in 1980, uh, we used maybe eight or 10 elements of the periodic table. And subsequently we have done 80 to 90 elements of periodic table. So we have really explored a lot of new materials from 80 new elements. And of course periodic table has 118 elements. Exactly. So we have 20 more elements to go. and. Uh, but it's not just the A element or B element, it's the number of elements are maybe alloys. So, and there are so many, you know, great universities in the world, in Europe, in US, and uh, other parts of uh, Asia as well. I think the time has come where universities need to collaborate together and focus on the material science aspect, the chemistry aspect, and uh, find the new materials which will speed up the, the development of applications for AI and quantum computing because without the solving the heat dissipation problem or energy conservation problems, AI and quantum computing will slow us down. Sorry, long answer to your question, but uh, I think I, I wanted to tell you that the potential is huge, but opportunities are huge, but challenges are also huge. We'll talk about some of the other challenges, actually, but um, tell us a little bit about this. Um, yeah, I think you did say, uh, whereas you know, the industry has sort of got this target of $1 trillion uh, dollars by 2030, and you, you threw out there a statement saying, well, with quantum, we, we probably get to $5 trillion by 2050. Now, that's a 20-year sort of um, time frame. Uh, is there any, anything to that, or, or is that just something uh, that you know, is aspirational? Well, one thing I would say, it's not a target. I think that's the potential. 
that uh, the way our industry is growing i mean we were growing uh, for last uh, in last year many years for double digit growth it's like 15 to 17 or 80% growth and of course we had a decline in 23 uh, by 2 or 3% and uh, so average is kegar has been 8% and the 8% kegar will take the current ic revenue of 23 to 2030 or 2031 or 32 by 1 trillion now the the is if somebody can predict exactly which which time frame that person will be probably the smartest person in the world but uh, there are so many headwinds like geopolitical tensions also come in the way the climate issues are coming in our way the talent shortage is coming in our way so there are so many issues so many headwinds so i think we need to really uh, keep those in mind so it's setting a target is not the right approach is really to see how much more we can do year after year because the the benefits of the these developments are really great for the humanity because the number of new applications will be will be tremendous now why i'm so much inspired about quantum computing i mean today we become the victim of the the calamities due to climate and we can't predict very precisely when the earthquake will come or when the tsunami will happen and the benefits of quantum computing will be it will give you a lot more clarity or or prediction that the there may be a, a tsunami in this area or earthquake in this area if not to the exact minute but definitely to the few hours from this so that way we can save a lot of lives that otherwise you get uh, stranded with those uh, calamities take over you and you can take care of your own destiny if quantum computing can predict that there will be a problem here and there and so on so that's why i feel the quantum computing will bring a lot of benefits to the humanity okay um let's uh, switch gears a bit i mean semi uh, i think the whole ecosystem we we heard a lot about the different parts of the ecosystem value chain yesterday but um one of the things you said in in your keynote is um around the number of fabs coming on on board over the next few years but also it's still not being enough capacity to meet that sort of 1 trillion target so to just explain a little bit about that and you know wh- what do you think the other things we can do to to help that on no that's a very important question uh, because when we say number of fabs basically i look at the opportunities for for people for jobs so <clears throat> semi collects this data on a regular basis the new fabs coming uh, in in the world so the last quarterly data that we published that 109 fabs are coming around the world in operation by 20, 2026 and we have also the data real data checking on the 89 of the 109 fabs have already in some stage of from ground breaking to the construction to the first equipment to be maybe on first wafer so it's a real happening then we do the calculations on uh, the output of these fabs uh, how many wafers it will produce and what's the revenue per wafer and you can see that it does not add up to 1 trillion yet so the our rough rough calculations show that probably between 2026 and 2030 there may be another close to 100 fabs coming up so why this information is important for ordinary person each fab within the fab we have roughly 2000 people working inside these are high paying jobs with uh, with the degrees in bachelor's master's phd's and for every one employee in a fab there are five employees in the ecosystem around the fab so you can say that each fab brings 10000 people a uh, 10 to 12000 people so now you multiply with 100 fabs or 110 fabs you can see how many people we're talking about now then another 100 fabs so it's really a big big uh, growth factor for 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 the regions where the fabs are coming yeah that's interesting so um, um I mean we just heard in the last uh, week about uh, the you know f- new fabs uh, in India for example the 15 billion investment what what it, there's all these different countries bringing on different capa- capabilities and capacities uh what are your thoughts on 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 all of this uh, obviously it's positive isn't it I think it's very positive the reason I feel is super positive because <coughs> with 5 uh, uh, 500 billion revenues to date roughly give and take uh <coughs> the most of the hubs are a uh, few countries us and maybe i should say in case some cases continent like europe and uh, then in uh, asia we have china uh, region taiwan 
and we have South Korea and Japan. But uh, what we experienced during pandemic, along with the Russia-Ukraine war, along with the climate challenges, that we had a major disruption of, uh, of the world. The chip shortages uh, created a huge uh, challenges for the, for, for the humanity. You were not able to get uh, computers on time, you were not able to get cars. The lead time on cars went from, from the showroom to, to 18 months, yes. uh, you know, even for the state of the, uh, uh, the regular car. Yeah, so, parts. that's right, uh, and the parts, I mean, you couldn't get your, uh, your refrigerator ref uh, uh, fixed because they couldn't get a five cent sen sensor yes. uh, in uh, two months lead time. So again, we saw the problem. So my thinking is this, if this industry is going to double to one trillion, can we continue, can we depend on the same number of hubs we have today? The answer is absolutely not. So what are the other hubs we should get? I've seen the big growth uh, in uh, in the Southeast Asia. Vietnam is really stepping up on the back end uh, type activities. Malaysia is stepping on the back end activities as well. So on the front end activities, India had been talking about this for many years, but their policy was not really properly defined. For the first time, India has done the right thing. The geopolitical issues, the the the, the, the political landscape, the capacity uh, and the vision, and the policies are all aligned for India. I mean, if you look at India, not because I come from India, so I have to speak about India. Actually, I was not in favor of the fabs of in, in India until the policy came. But now with this right policy and with the two ministers who have a really uh, deep background of semiconductors, as well as the Prime Minister of India is very visionary, I think there's a very good focus on India. Now, India has a lot of talent. It doesn't have the ecosystem yet, but the policy supports to bring ecosystem. And <clears throat> so I think their approach is right, and the recent announcement is a really a good start. I think uh, the credit goes to, to Micron, who took the first uh, leap of the faith and said, we, wanna, we believe in this uh, policy, and they will be a big catalyst for other companies, and that catalyst is working. So we have three announcements uh, uh, in India last week. Uh, one more assembly and test by Tata, and uh, Tata will be fab, and there's another three, five uh, compound fab, uh, semiconductor fab. So I think that's the start, but that's not gonna cut it, only these announcements. We need many more to come. But when I talk about one trillion, and we talk about 100 fabs now and 100 more fabs in the uh, next uh, second half of this decade. Yes. So India should play. Also, India is a huge market. And there's a lot of talent there. There are a lot of great universities. They pr produce a lot of quality students in all disciplines uh, necessary for, for this industry. So potential is there. If uh, they do it right and uh, the, if they integrate with the rest of the world to make sure the ecosystem comes and uh, the, they have to do everything right first time and to make it happen. And it's interesting, you mentioned Vietnam as well. I, I was there with, with the E-Times back in November, and you know, they talked about how they're providing a lot of the training uh, for the semiconductor uh, fab uh, technicians and skills for the US. So it's still a very global, connected, uh, collaborative community, and that was one of your key messages yesterday. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's really the way to go, because talent shortage is such a serious problem in not only in semi-industry, but every industry, but especially semi-industry, because semi-industry needs STEM-based talent. And the problem in the STEM talent is, in US and Europe, the STEM enrollment in elementary school has gone down by a factor of two in the last two or three decades. Whereas in Asian countries, the population control, the STEM number of children going into STEM education our number of children to a couple used to be more than two, now it's less than one or close to one. So I think the STEM population is going down in Asian countries, whereas in the US and uh, Europe, STEM interest in STEM education has gone down. So there have been a lot of focus on how to really uh, inspire the young couples and young kids to get into STEM education because these opportunities in the industry are huge because the j you get very high paying jobs and also people don't understand semi-industry is a transformational industry. It really, all the challenges we have, like climate challenges, and only semiconductor will be the part of the solution there. So the young kids, if you listen to, to this interview, if you come to semiconductor industry, you will be transforming the world. 
So this is really an important uh, future for you guys. So kids, STEM education, you can do wonders and you will t change the world and you will rule the world if you follow my advice. That's a really excellent message. Uh, I just be before we finish, I just wanted to ask you uh, because you did talk about some of the challenges, um, and you know, we talked about talent and uh, path to net zero. I think you've talked about yesterday, but uh, one of the other things is uh, something called PFAS, and I'm not going to try and explain to our audience what that stands for. But uh, if you're in the industry, you understand what the issue is. But tell us a little bit about the issue, and uh, we've got a little bit of a leeway in terms of you know, trying to find alternatives, but there are issues and you know, big challenges for this industry because we're dependent on it. Is that right? Well, PFAS is basically, the, in the layman language, I'll say it's a kind of a polymer which has, has many different uh, shapes and, uh, and, and uh, construction uh, designs. And PFAS is used in many, many parts of our life. If you see an ordinary foam, it has PFAS inside. If you see the O-rings or gaskets which go on the equipment as a vacuum seals, there is uh, PFAS in that. At home, when you cook uh, food in the frying pans, and they call it Teflon coating, the Teflon coating inside has PFAS too. Yeah. PFAS, use, PFAS is not a good stuff for health. Yeah. But only if you consume PFAS, it can hurt you. But if you're not consuming it, it's, it's, it's inert stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt you, but it's, it's a bond between carbon and fluorine, which is the strongest bond. If you are a chemist, you will understand and appreciate what I'm talking about. Mm. And so this is it's a kind of it stays in the environment. So our industry is very responsible. We use PFAS for making, making chips in many different processes. And of course, the, the regulators are looking for the humanity the, the health issues, so they want to really limit the use of PFAS, but it's not the use of PFAS, it's the use of, is the PFAS going into the environment is the problem. And our industry, semi-industry, is not the culprit. We do not put PFAS in the environment. Our chips do not have PFAS inside, but the things around the chip have PFAS in, inside. But if regulators put the ban on PFAS, then what you experience during pandemic of uh, chip shortage, it will shut down the world. So we need to work with regulators and with universities to make sure that we are responsible not only in semi-industry but other industries which use PFAS so that we do not harm the human beings, we do not harm the planet. Because for me, preserving our planet for the future generation is the most important thing for all of us. If we don't preserve the planet, planet, why are we doing anything in this world? It doesn't mean anything to me. So PFAS is one of the crises that we are facing right now. But good news is that the policymakers around the world are working with semi-industry and I'm sure with other industries to figure out how we make sure that we do not harm, harm our society and yet keep this industry going. And But again, a lot of work has to be done. Semi is actually in the right left center of this uh, activity around the globe we're working with the industries with the academia and with the governments to find a right solution which will help keep this industry going to the one trillion by 2030 and maybe beyond five trillions in the next 30 years yeah. well on that note ajit thank you very much thank you thank you very much thank you for having me